Hello, I'm Jean-Philippe Courtois. This is Positive Leadership, the podcast that helps you grow as an individual, as a leader, and ultimately as a global citizen. Truly great leaders create the right conditions to awaken the potential with people. It requires a certain amount of skill, open-mindedness, flexibility, agility, and optimism. And above all, trust. In fact, some would argue nothing is as inspiring as offering trust. My guest today, Stephen M. R. Covey, is a global authority on trust, helping organizations and individuals to increase and leverage trust to achieve superior performance. He's also the best-selling author of The Speed of Trust, and more recently, Trust and Inspire, or Truly Great Leaders Unleash the Greatness in Others. Stephen, I'm delighted to have you on the podcast. Hi, hi. it's so wonderful to be with you, Jean-Philippe. Very excited to have this conversation about <laughs> trust and positive leadership. Thank you so much, Stephen. So I'd like to start off with your childhood and family background, if you don't mind. Your father, Please. Stephen R. Covey, was the, of course, infamous author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of the most influential business books of the 20th century, and I would say 21st century too, by the way. But I was moved to read the dedication to your late mother on Instagram recently, well, I think refer to her as a true trust and inspired parent. So how did your mom and your dad and your eight siblings, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> model <laughs> trust and inspire? And how did that shape you? And what made you want to follow in your dad's footsteps and join the company setup? Many questions in one. So I let you unfold, all, uncover all of that, Stephen. Well, thank you, JP. It's, it was in, inspiring for me to have <clears throat> such... Uh, magnificent parents. I was very fortunate, very blessed, and and um, and so I feel a sense of stewardship because of that. And um, I think both my mother and my father were what I call trust and inspire parents. And by that I mean, some they were parents who who believed in me, who saw my potential, and who helped me come to see it in myself. And that's what I think a trust inspire leader or person does for another is that they see potential and talent and then they communicate that potential and talent so that the other person can come to see it. Hmm. And then they seek to develop it and then they seek to unleash it, to, to, to really let the person have their opportunity to, to demonstrate it and show it. And, and having that kind of um, belief in you by somebody. And in this case, by my, 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 by my mother, by my father, really helped me come to believe in myself mm. and, and, um, and helped me develop my potential such that I, I, I believe that this is such a powerful way of leading that I desire to do the same for others. And that's what this, this new book, Trust and Inspire, yeah. is all about, is how as leaders we can see, communicate, mm. develop, and unleash the potential, the greatness that's inside of people. And it started really from uh, how, how I grew up in my home yes. with my, my father Please. and my mother and how yeah. they believed in me. So c c c would you mind maybe sharing one or two little stories about your mom, the way she saw your potential, Stephen, <laughs> and the way she uncovered it, and your dad, because I'm sure they come with different angles and different ways of making that happen through your life. Absolutely, yes. Uh, my mother always would uh, affirm me and and uh, would would state to me affirmations of who I was and what I could do mm. and and um, and believed in me in such a way that that I began to say well maybe she believes in me so much maybe I can do this and <laughs> and she and then and, but she would validate that she would affirm it and she would give yeah. reasons why I could do this mm. and and um and and because it was not just um, ethereal of, you know, yeah. you can do this. It was more specific hmm. tied to here's why you can do this. Hmm. You have these kind of abilities and these talents. I've seen it firsthand. And, and so I would say affirmation, affirmation was something that I heard time and again from her that was very direct, very specific. Hmm. And, but such that I could actually see myself in the affirmation she was giving. Correct. And, and, uh, and, and that's what I think was a hallmark of how I, what I learned from her and what I felt from her. Yeah. And, and, uh, and it happened in all aspects of my life. 
Hey, and, what about and, your what about your dad? If I may, it's so wonderful to have that affirmation giving you confidence, I guess, on the specificity of your strengths or where you shine right. at, where you're the best at. What about your dad? Was he less affirmative, more subtle, or <laughs> how did it come through? <laughs> well, he, he also would affirm, but what I would emphasize with my dad is how he would then extend trust hmm. and give me responsibilities and opportunities starting from when I was just a seven-year-old boy uh -huh. in, in what, what he writes about in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, yes. green and clean, hmm. green and clean, the story where he, he was teaching his young son to take care of our lawn, our yard. Yes. Yes. I was, I was that green and clean child. <laughs> I was, I was the seven-year-old boy given this big responsibility. This was back in the day before we had automatic sprinklers. Of <laughs> and we had, you know, this huge lawn, three different locations. And he turned the job over to me as a seven year old to take care of it. Hmm. And and um, he trusted me and he believed in me. And, and he, but he built an agreement with me of how we, I would do this and how I would judge myself yeah. against the standard of green and clean. And we would walk around once a week with with accountability. But I was responsible. And hmm. while while at first I didn't respond initially I then quickly hmm. responded to that trust that he gave and and took responsibility for that job. And and as a young seven year old, I took care of the yard and it was green and it was clean, not only that year, but for many years to come. So I would say that my father, he took the idea of affirmation and, and extended yeah. it to an actual extension of trust with hmm. expectations and with accountability built yes. into the trust being extended and how that brought out the best in me as well as I realized that I was a, I was responsible and I I had these capabilities and I could take ownership and I could actually achieve and do things and get the result but my father's intent all along was not so much yeah. that I had that he had a great green and clean yard he cared about that but he cared far more about, about you. developing me. Yes, growing exactly. you. more than That's the right. land itself. <laughs> That's exactly. wonderful. He, uh, 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 yes, please, sorry. Please, well, please. he, he he yeah. summarized it as this. When, when at first I wasn't quite responding at first, he hmm. said, he kind of breathed in a deep thought, a deep breath, and he said, remember my purpose, raise children, not grass. <laughs> so his, <laughs> his real intent was always to raise the child. But he, the interesting thing is he both raised the child and he got a green and clean lawn as well. You got a, <laughs> super. So w wonderful start, uh, Stephen. Can you tell us, Obviously, you start with a strong foundation with your mom and dad, and you just did a wonderful job uh, framing it. But what led you uh, eventually to create the trust and inspire model, right? To formalize that through your life, I guess, experiences, learnings, mistakes, and more. And then one day, well, not just one day, I guess, a moment, you decide to, to make it clear, bring it clear to everyone. So what, what was the trigger to do that? What the trigger was, was... When I, when I was able to spend time actually uh, before my dad passed away doing uh, workshops and public seminars around the world with him, yeah. Yeah. and he would talk about seven habits and the eighth habit, I would talk about the speed of trust, hmm. but he would always begin each session by asking the audience, you know, how many of you believe that the vast majority of your workforce has more talent ingenuity, skill, capability, and greatness more than their current job requires or even allows them to, to contribute. To contribute, yeah. And almost and almost every hand would go up. That's Everyone's right, saying yeah. there's a lot more <laughs> there's a lot more talent inside of our people than we're asking or getting from them. Yeah. Then the second question was, and how many of you are under immense pressure to do more with less? And again, almost every hand would go up and just the juxtaposition of that, that we're under this intense pressure to produce more. And yeah. yet we're not tapping anywhere near into people's talents and capabilities. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> and I realize it's, you know, that's a leadership gap yes, issue. that the yeah. way we're leading is not tapping into that. And so I began to, to look at how we need to, you know, a, a new world of work requires a new way to lead and the old model what I call kind of the command and control model mm. is not going to work in this new world, even in a, a more enlightened version of it. If yeah. we view people like things, we need a way to tap into that talent and that capability and to unleash it 
and to see it, to develop it, all these things so that we tap into the potential that's out there to solve our problems today. I love how Mahatma Gandhi put it. He said, the difference between what we are currently doing and what we are capable of doing hmm. would, would solve most of the world's problems. <laughs> so right. trying to tap into that talent, to see it, to communicate it, to develop it, to unleash it, the talent, the greatness, the potential inside of people requires leadership. And we need to lead in a new way to tap into that kind of talent to solve our, our problems in our world today. So that's that just that process yep. of yep. seeing this gap and, <laughs> and asking why aren't we tapping into that and really recognizing this is a leadership opportunity for all of us. And what if I could articulate a way to do it? And so the key was kind of the naming of this. Yeah. And the idea was – Rather than command and control, the mm. old style of leadership, it's trust and inspire. Inspire. A new way to lead in a new world of work. No, w wonderful uh, setup, uh, Stephen, for, for, for the coming dialogue actually on trust, because it's uh, such a deep concern, but also such a deep opportunity, as you, as you said. You know, I was just uh, meeting actually with Richard Edelman last week, <laughs> and uh, he just issued his last version, you know, the famous Edelman Trust Barometer. It's a yearly barometer for people listening to the podcast. And he says that the macro pressures manifest at individual level in a sort of fears ranging from inflation, of course, to nuclear war right now in Europe. We can feel it, I can tell you. And these fears are on top of pre-existing worries about job losses to automation, impact of climate change. And the consequence is a descent from distrust to an acute polarization society that we can see, I'm sure, both in Americas, in Europe and elsewhere in the yes. world. And he predicts that without intervention, we'll see a continued move from a crisis of institutional trust to a crisis of interpersonal trust. So would you agree with that statement? And, and what, you know, what comes out of that statement on top of your mind, uh, given what you've seen in society, in business, across the world, you've been traveling the world as well, right here, right now, with what's going on in the world? Um, yes, I <coughs> fundamentally, I do agree with that. First of all, I think the Richard Edelman and, and the Edelman Trust Barometer has been a very useful tool for the world to see what's happening with trust, to have these conversations every year with the trust barometer coming out. But I think in the basic premise that the world in which we're operating, where there's a distrust in institutions and the like and how we've become polarized, that the reason I believe that that will ultimately affect interper interpersonal trust is because distrust is contagious. Hmm. It's kind of the environment we're operating in. And when we look and we wonder, can I trust this institution and can I trust these people? And we polarize, we, you know, we get polarized into tribal camps. You start to wonder and question, who can you trust and what else is out there? And all of that is a, is a, a pressure and it, it impacts people. It starts to affect how they view yeah. not only the world, but even how they view other people yep. and each other. And they, and they sometimes are not even fully aware that they're being impacted by this low trust world, this low trust environment. But it begins to affect my interpretation of other people and that, you know, I wonder if I can trust this person. And we start to become less yeah. and less trusting. Hmm. And if we're not trusting of others, then they tend to not trust us back. Hmm. And we could find ourselves perpetuating a vicious downward cycle yeah. of distrust and suspicion, creating more distrust and suspicion. Hmm. And everybody, everybody feeling justified in the in the process. See, distrust is contagious, and that's the danger of a low trust world. It tends to perpetuate itself. Yeah. But I, but I am more optimistic and, and believe <laughs> that that in the long run, that just like okay. distrust is is, is contagious, you so is trust. Easy. And trust okay. and confidence can create more trust and confidence. But I think these pressures are very real. Mm -hmm. I do think there's mm -hmm. a ripple effect in either direction. And right now, because of the external and the lack of institutional trust, the distrust at the macro level, it yes. does impact us at the micro level of how yes. we even view each other. And especially if we're not fully aware that we look yeah. at the world through a lens. Absolutely. So I'd like to build on that, Stephen, actually. You know, we often think about trust as a social asset, an enabler in society and business as much as within a family or a couple as well. 
From my experience as a leader, I know that establishing trust is fundamental if you want to get your team members to bring their very best authentic selves to the table. And also if you want to build a safe environment where mistakes are addressed and tackled in a most effective way. But building trust can take a lot of time and patience as well. So the question for you and for our listeners, where do you start and how do you build trust one person and one team at a time? It's a beautiful question. And I think that where you start is by looking in the mirror hmm. and starting with yourself, with ourselves, each of us. Yes. We look in the mirror and we ask this question, do I trust myself? Do I trust myself? Do I give to my team, to my colleagues, to my family, to my neighborhood, to those I interact with? Do I give to them a person, a leader who they can trust? Is it smart to trust me? That self-trust, trust of yourself, giving others a person that they can trust is the foundation of all trust. And then from there, hmm. you, do, you do ripple out into your relationships, one Jesus. person at a time one relationship at a time. And then you can ripple out to a team, maybe your team. Yeah. So it's not that I'm trying to change the whole world. Instead, yeah. I'm trying to impact my team, my team yeah. by first impacting my relationships one-on-one -on -one and by modeling it myself. And then I work on my team. And then I ask, what if our team could become a catalyst to build trust with another team that we interact with? Mm -hmm. And then with another, and another, and you begin to ripple out mm -hmm. into the larger department and then you ripple out into the whole organization and then out to our stakeholders with partners and customers and then out into society, into communities. So it's it's always inside out. It's simple. Yeah. It's just yeah. not easy. <laughs> simple, but not easy. But, but, and, if but I, it's, yeah. if I it's may, always inside out. Inside out. I, lo I love it. But if I may, I'd like to come back to the first ripple in a way, right? Myself. Yes. <laughs> How do I trust myself? How did you do that with yourself, Stephen, uh, taking that example? Or maybe the work you've done coaching some leaders and others across the world. How do you do that? Because it's not easy as well to look at yourself in a mirror by yourself and say, yeah, hey, Stephen or JP, I'm trusted. No, I can diffuse that trust to others. Right. I think two things that can help <laughs> increase self-trust. First is to learn to make and keep commitments to yourself. It's, it's interesting that the fastest way to build trust with another person is to make a person a commitment and then to keep it yes. and make another commitment and, and to keep it and to repeat that process. You make, keep, repeat, repeat. make, keep, repeat. <laughs> you build trust that fast that way. Guess what? That's also the fastest way to build trust with yourself. With you. To mm. make and keep commitments to yourself. And sometimes we don't keep a commitment to our to ourself with the same respect we might treat a commitment to somebody else, but Correct. we should with ourselves as well and have that sense of clarity, of integrity, of power, personal power with ourselves. But also, if we can focus on saying, look, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to focus on my character yeah. and my competence. So my credibility, I'm always working on it. I never, you know, I'm never, I never arrive, but I'm always working on my character, my competence and behaving myself into greater trust because it matters to me and I'm trying to I'm trying to model, model. I'm trying to go first yes. and be a model of the kind of behavior I want to see so if I want to see more transparency then I model transparency if I want to see more respect shown and demonstrated I model respect Choice. and if I want to see more trust then I model both trustworthiness yes. but also a willingness to be trusting to extend that trust so maybe, JP, I would just add yes. that last thing. As you work from the inside out, yeah, starting with yeah. yourself and then your relationship and then with others and teams and so forth, if you as a leader, if you'll focus on two things first, mm -hmm. focus on being trustworthy, and that's your your character, your competence. You'll be a model. Yeah. But second, focus on being trusting, mm -hmm. on giving the trust and extending the trust. Because if you think about it, you could have two trustworthy people working together yeah. and yet yep. no trust between them, yes. even though they're both even though they're both trustworthy, if right. neither person is willing to extend trust to the other. So not only do we have to be trustworthy, which is modeling, yeah. we also need to be trusting. 
Trust and us. I think that is the essence of great leadership is that we extend that trust to others and ignite the potential and talent that's within them. I think it's an act of leadership to extend trust to another person. Uh, I do agree with you uh, 100%, Stephen. I love the way you, you make the deep distinction between your self trust in yourself and the way you have to keep commitments and execute on your own commitments, which is not easy, depending on the way you, you raise the bar. Sometimes you have to take it easier as well on yourself. <laughs> That's a deep, different discussion. And the way you, you are trusting others and empower them to do more with that. So, you know, in your book as well, to continue the discussion, you made it clear that trust, of course, a very powerful enabler and transformer if you can inspire others as well. But there's a lot of confusion I found often between charisma, inspiration, and a few other words. So uh, what's the difference, Stephen? And what, you know, how do you create the spark of inspiration? How do you build it within yourself? Maybe that's not within yourself. And then propagate that with some positive energy coming from yourself to others. Yes, and I love how you um, distinguish this and phrase that, that, that inspiration and charisma are different. I, I know some people who are charismatic, hmm. but who are not inspiring. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> I, I know other people who no one would describe necessarily as charismatic, <laughs> but who are extraordinarily inspiring hmm. yes. because of who they are, hmm. how they connect, how they care, how they lead. And so they're different, inspiring others doesn't necessarily require charisma. Inspiring others is a learnable skill. It's something we can learn to do. And you are right. We start with ourselves. We model. When you model the behavior, that's inspiring to other people. When you extend trust to them, that inspires. To be trusted is the most inspiring form of human motivation. But, but then what really makes this connect and resonate is when you connect with people through a sense of caring mm. and belonging, that will inspire others. Mm. Connection through caring and belonging. And then when you connect people to purpose yeah. and to meaning <laughs> and to contribution, that will inspire. And yeah. if you start with yourself, if you are inspired because you have a sense of pur purpose, if the fire within you is already lit, yeah. then that lit fire can light other fires. But if the <laughs> fire within you is, is, is gone out, is snuffed out because of the challenging world we're in and we've lost our inspiration, our spark, it's hard to light another fire. So always you know, start with yourself and become, find your why, become inspired, mm. your purpose, yeah. and then focus on connecting with people through caring and then connecting others to purpose, to meaning, to contribution, to mattering. And the whole idea is that everyone can inspire it's actually a learnable skill it's not just for the charismatic i'll give it's, one last thought on inspiration yeah please and that is it it comes from the latin word inspirare which means to breathe life into hmm. so when we inspire we're breathing life into relationships into teams into uh into, into cultures whereas command and control tends to suck the life out of trust yeah. and inspire breathe the life <laughs> into and we ignite the fire that was that's within. You know, inspiration is extra is it, excuse me is intrinsic, yeah. whereas motivation is external, extra, you know, outside of us. Intrinsic, you have to yeah. provide more rewards. Inspiration is internal. It's inside of people. You light that fire within, which can burn for months, maybe even years, without having to go back to external stimuli. That's a far better way to lead in our world today. To move from motivation to inspiration, and everyone can learn to inspire. I love it. And I can almost visualize the fires of inspiration you talked about, Stephen. Indeed, you know, uh, one of the things I enjoy the most in my life is over the past several years now, I've been coaching a, a bunch of young social entrepreneurs who want to change yes. the world. And guess what? Many of them don't have the confidence in themselves at the beginning, don't have the, the charisma at all, but they have so much purpose, so much <laughs> clarity on the way they want to change the world. They are incredibly inspiring. And we get them on stage after, of course, you're doing some work on, on, the, on the semantics, the words and all that. Right. Wow. The people who are much more grown up than themselves are like incredible. They are all <laughs> impressed by the inspiration. So I've seen that in action. It's highly contagious in a positive way. <laughs> uh, 
absolutely. And, and it's it's within people. And when they can find that within themselves and then connect to that broader idea of purpose and a meaning and a contribution of significance, of mattering, yeah. leaving a legacy, that inspires. And, and, um, and I really believe that we can create and embed purpose, mm. meaning, and contribution into almost any role, yeah. into almost any organization if we're intentional about it and really seek to serve – you know, serve others to bless, to serve human needs, seek to bless, not to impress. That will inspire. And these examples of these social entrepreneurs yeah. that you work with, yeah. that it may be that at their stage of their career that they don't have necessarily that platform yet. But if they right. have that sense of who yeah. they are, what they're about, and the, and the sense of purpose, meaning, and contribution, and then they can connect with an, a motive of caring and That's making true. a difference in mattering, that will inspire. And and that lights the other fires in others, and and we can we can really have this become contagious, just like trust. So both trust and inspiration can be contagious. L love it. Let, let's let's continue the dialogue, and in a way, I mean, extend the discussion on leadership. In your book, you describe leadership as a stewardship, right? First, you model the behaviors you want to see, and this builds trust. Interestingly, at Microsoft, we created and implemented the management framework. Stephen called model, coach, and care. So as you work with many large companies in the world and their leadership teams, right, how do you get them to practice what care means and what model implies in their day-to-day -day lives? Because words sometimes are, you know, are big on a wall, on a slide, but, well, making them real in your life is something else. So how do you do that? Yes, and making it come alive is where the real action is. Exactly. <laughs> so, well, first of all, let me say this at the outset that I love the Microsoft model of, of model and coach, coach and care. And, and um, um, I've, I've spent time with Kathleen Hogan yeah. and, you know, you, JP, and others. And I know, I know that how Sachin Adela has led. And, and, um, and if you look at the core model in the Trust and Inspire book, it's the same three principles. I just slightly label it different. Yep. I'm calling it mod modeling, trusting, trusting. inspiring. Hmm. But, but in a very real sense, to model, trust, inspire is very similar to, to model, coach, and care. Because modeling is modeling. That's just, that's 100% bullseye yes. hit. So we have model. When you model that people, they, people get inspired by that, but they also have a way forward. They can see what to do. Um, when you trust another, you move from managing people to coaching yes. because you believe in them, you trust them. So you don't have to manage them. No. You're trying to coach them and help them succeed. So that's a mindset shift. But the fundamental um, belief that triggers that, that enables that, is your belief in them, your extension of trust to them that moves you from a management model to a coaching model and where from a con you know controlling model to a trusting model hmm. and so i believe that that's a beautiful alignment as well and learning how to extend that trust with expectations and accountability so that you both get the job done and you do it in a way that grows the person yeah. that's the real magic hmm. because you you want to you want to deliver results in a way that grows the person yeah. through the extension of trust that's trusting and you know in the microsoft language that's the coaching and finally the care, my, I call it inspire. And I'm saying that inspiring yeah. others comes when you connect with people through caring. Yeah. So that's very much what you're doing at Microsoft, the caring. And when you care for another, you will you will inspire them. Hmm. It inspires in others to when they feel that there's a sense of caring, a relationship of caring. And you might even say in some situations of love. Hmm. But also, you will inspire when you connect to purpose. Yes. And the meaning of contribution. And again, I know that Microsoft also has focused on purpose mm -hmm. as a way of inspiring as well. And so I believe there's a beautiful overlay. And I think if if leaders see that I have these three stewardships mm -hmm. to model, to trust and inspire, mm -hmm. that's what my by a stewardship, I mean a job with a trust. These are responsibilities that come with leadership, not yeah. rights. Yeah. They're responsibilities. Yeah. The, of what my people um, can expect from me and should expect from me, that I will model, 
that I will trust and be trusting and that I will inspire by connecting with people and connecting to purpose. And if I kind of go into that, that yep. these are the stewardships, responsibilities I have, how can I lead out by modeling, trusting, inspiring? It becomes a mindset for who I am and how I lead and the kind of leadership that people are going to respond to in our world of work today. It's yeah. such a better approach than the, the traditional command and control and I'm I'm the boss, I'm in charge, positional yeah. leadership. That's just not relevant in a new world of work with multiple generations and Gen Z and millennials that don't want to be managed, that want to be led, that want to be trusted, that want to be inspired. So, so, so well said, uh, Stephen, and so much in alignment in a way with the, the way we try to do it every day because it's not, it's not a given, right. it's hard work, <laughs> it's a practice no, as well. It's a journey. And, yes, a journey. So, extending the dialogue and stewardship, right? And as you said rightly, it's not just about leadership rights, right? it's actually a lot more about leadership duties and accountabilities and what you need to do. You know, bringing clarity around what's working, what's, what's not working in a business, in a company like Microsoft and others. Uh, I mean, it's something we have to think a lot about every day, right? It's called accountability in many ways. And so I'd like, I'd like to get your thoughts on the best way to do that and about the role of accountability within that trust building that you talked about. And, and just to add a couple of more, another story actually to, to enrich a little bit the, the, the discussion, I had Pete Carroll that I'm sure you may know from as the head coach yes. of the Seahawks on, on the show on the podcast a while ago, a wonderful discussion he is maybe, as you know, holding a weekly accountability meeting with the Seahawks. And he said, he told me, you know, it's super important for people to fulfill their potential. It's a time where everyone, it's on Monday, is encouraged to put their hand up and say, I messed up. I could have done this better, coach <laughs> or team. And I, as I discuss the potential of positive leadership, there's often a misconception that being positive most of the time stops you from holding people accountable and driving high quality performance. So Stephen, in your own experience, how do you balance the care you show for people, the trust you build in them with the need for real accountability? And you also believe with the value of accountability meetings, whatever the shape of those meetings are, by the way. Yes, beautiful, I do. And I, be I believe completely with what Pete Carroll said and with what you're describing here, JP, that yep. this, this accountability is essential both for the building and the maintaining of trust, hmm. but also for the the development and the unleashing of the potential, both. And and here's how it works, because because you're right. Sometimes people yeah. they they paint it as an either or kind of are 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 you going to hold me accountable or are you going to trust me? Yeah. As if they were two little two different things. Yeah. Yeah. But no, they're they're interconnected. Absolutely. They're 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 very much related. When we extend trust to others, we're always doing it with a sense of the clear expectations around the yep. trust that we're extending, yep. and an agreed upon, a mutually agreed upon process yes. for accountability right. to those expectations. And so I call this building the agreement together. Hmm. Hmm. So you build the agreement together, which has two halves clarifying expectations yep. and agreeing to a mutual process of accountability mm. to those expectations. And if up front you build that agreement together, then you can find as a leader that you can be far more trusting of others yep. and, and give them more trust because you've built an agreement with expectations and accountability. So as a leader, you're not losing control. Yep. It's just, it's not hierarchical micromanagement control. No, it's yep. control through the agreement control through the relationship, through context, as opposed to I have to hover over and micromanage the person. No, we built an agreement. And the mm -hmm. person holds himself accountable to the expectations of that agreement and they report back as we agreed together. And that way I become more of a coach and a mentor and I help them. And yet there's accountability built right into the process. And, and look, this is even what my father did with me with the green and clean story when I was seven years old, <laughs> yeah. because he he spent two weeks training me that I want the yard, the lawn, to be green and clean. So those were the expectations, the, the uh, green and clean. But then we he built a process for accountability where he said this. So what what we're going to do is let's walk the yard 
once a week and you tell me how we are doing against the standard of green and clean. So that was the process for accountability that once a week we would walk the yard and I would report on how we were doing against the standard of green and clean, the expectations. And so even as a young seven year old, he trusted me, but always with expectations and accountability. And what that does is that Mm. brings out the best in people. Absolutely. And they do develop that mm. potential and they keep the trust because if we don't have expectations and accountability, at some point we'll lose the trust yeah. well, it, or it will become a blind trust without, you know, it's not tied to the results and the outcomes and it won't work. And we'll kind of pull back and say, oh, I've got to hover over and micromanage because I got to get these results yeah. and people won't hold themselves accountable. So you'll neither, without the accountability, you'll neither get the same results, but you also won't have the same level of trust. But with the accountability built in, in the process of building the agreement, you'll get better results because you'll then move into a coaching model to help the person succeed and you build a higher level of trust with the person. So you really win on every front it's where you get results in a way that grows the person. And so a title to achieve that. And the key is do it together, build the agreement together then the person can hold themselves accountable as opposed to you having to hover over and micromanage their every move when you don't have an agreement. So I, I, lo- I love the way you are resisting to the famous tyranny of all, right, Stephen? It's not trust or inspire. It's trust and inspire together. <laughs> uh, I love it. Precisely. That, that, that's, part of, that's part of the art of leadership. And what would be... It's trust uh, and inspire. And it's also this. It's, it's, it's get the job done and grow the person and grow the person it's not that's not either or Agreed. that's always Agreed. both too that's what trusting does we can get we can get the job done better and do it in a way that grows the person that grow the person and so what would be a, in a simple way uh what would be the kind of a common best practice that you could share with our listeners in a podcast on where to start to incorporate that in their own day-to-day weekly monthly routines how would you advise them to to do that. Yes, I would say this, that if you could always say, look, I know that by trusting others and extending trust, that tends to bring out the best in people. It tends to inspire them. They tend to reciprocate and return the trust. And they also grow and develop. So this is a good thing. But I also know that I'm responsible for results. I've got to get the results and the outcome. So I want to do it through trusting people, but if I don't build that agreement, I could find that I could get, I could run, you know, awry and, and, and get off track and, and not, and have it become a blind trust instead of a smart yeah. trust and not get the result hmm. and, and, um, and, and have this not work. And then I, I, then I feel like I have to now come in and hover over and micromanage. And then it looks like I don't trust them. So I recognize I want to build. I want to get results in a way that grows people. The mm-hmm. way to do that is through trusting. But I've got to. The only way I want to trust is though, always, by building the agreement, and by focusing on those two halves of the of the agreement, clarifying expectations, mm-hmm. practicing accountability. Mm-hmm. And so I'm looking at every situation where I'm extending trust, and I say, Are there clear expectations? Have we agreed to a process of accountability? Have we done this together? If you build the agreement together, then you've involved people and there's far more commitment and they'll perform better and they will hold themselves accountable against the agreement you build together. It's just a far better way of doing it than you kind of hovering over and micromanaging and saying, I'm going to hold you accountable. No, they hold themselves accountable against the agreement you built together. That's it's a far better way of doing it. So the way to really operationalize it is look at all your trust relationships where you as a leader have extended trust and ask, what's the quality of the agreement hmm. have, that we built? Have we, are there clear expectations? Is there an agreed upon process of accountability to those expectations? Hmm. And always come back to that, knowing that the better you build the agreement, the more you'll get better results, but also the more you'll truly grow the person. And that's what we're seeking because then our ability to get results in the future has just gone up when people have grown and developed. So come back time and again to the quality of the agreement that you're building together. And one more thing, to the Mm -hmm. quality of the relationship 
yeah. that you have together. Because the higher the quality of that relationship, the more authentic and real it will be. And the more people will be very real about how they're genuinely doing. They know more than you do on how they're doing against sure. their results and the outcomes. And when they trust you, they'll be more open and real and honest with you. No, it's so true and I think so powerful, uh, Stephen, when you can bring that into action. You know, I spend a lot of time in uh, business, professional, social, personal life, you know, coaching people uh, across different teams. <laughs> and I was speaking uh, recently to my colleague, Amy Hood, who is Microsoft CFO, on a podcast, actually. And she's really clear that a manager's job is to provide supportive autonomy, that's her words, to give people the room they need to succeed in whatever it is that they want to achieve. And building on a dialogue, the common belief is that a leader needs to act with authority. But it will be times when you have to correct someone's behavior. So how can you be authoritative without being authoritarian? <laughs> Sorry for my French accent, but I guess you, you picked up the two words. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think this is critical because if, you know, there's the cynic or the critic might listen to this conversation and saying, OK, this is nice, but is this yeah. the real world where I've got to deliver and there's pressure and I got quarterly earnings, I got to do it now and I'm in charge. Well, again, I it's the power of the end. It is not the either or. It's just the whole premise is, look, we need to get results and we also need to grow the people. So this is not either or it's and and that's what trust and inspire leadership is all about getting results in a way that grows the people. And when you model, when you trust, and when you inspire, and by trusting, that includes building the agreement with the expectations and accountability mm. in a way that grows the person. And by inspiring, you connect with people through caring and belonging, but then connect people to the broader ideas of mm. purpose and meaning and contribution. That inspires. When you model and you trust and you inspire, then you are like a third alternative than the either or yeah. of, you know, this guy's just too hard, the authoritarian, this guy's too soft, they're abdicating and abandoning. No, you're trust and inspire. And that is when you become authoritative mm -hmm. without being authoritarian. A trust and inspire leader can be decisive mm -hmm. without being autocratic. A trust mm -hmm. and inspire leader can be strong mm -hmm. without being forceful. A trust and inspire mm -hmm. leader can be demanding without being demeaning or overbearing and a trust and inspire leader can be in charge and have control without being controlling hmm. they do it through the agreement they do it through context and the relationship and the culture that you built and so it is not an either or it is an and it's a better way to lead in our world it is strong and not weak and that's the kind of leadership that is needed today um, to model the trust to inspire it's what Satya is doing is what other Cheryl Batchelder who ran Popeyes what she did is what others are doing is the kind of leadership that is needed today it's a third alternative than the traditional kind of command and control or yeah. the kind of laissez-faire uh, complete yeah. abandon you know abdicate and abandon <laughs> that's not going to work either no trust and inspire which is strong without being forceful that's the idea it's authoritative without being authoritarian to use your words Super clear and incredibly strong, actually, uh, Stephen. Many thanks for making this trust and inspire story so real for listeners and really learning it. But I'd like to shift gears, and if you don't mind, come back to the foundational work of your dad. I'm talking um, about the amazing bestseller, of course, that he published in 1989, that I think has sold more than 40 million copies in the world, if not yes. 50. It's a huge number, incredible. Of course, I've read it many times in my life as well. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. In it, uh, if I may, you know it much better than I do, it defines three clusters of impact. You can build and develop to become highly effective. The first cluster is independence or self-mastery. The second one is interdependence. And the third one is self-renewal. I'm struck by the similarity with the positive psychology and positive leadership approach, actually, Stephen. With the positive leadership philosophy, you know, I tend to use these uh, three ripples analogy. And in a way, you've started to relate to that already in this uh, podcast. And I'm describing how to develop and grow positive mindsets, starting with me, the first ripple, which is about developing my self-awareness, my self-confidence, building on my strengths, and also the ability to manage my positive energy, physical, mental, cognitive, emotional, positively. 
so that I can actually align it with my purpose. The second ripple is, of course, me and others. How you learn, how you learn how to care, which you discuss a lot, or to communicate positively as well with others, not with naivety, but actually positively, and how to coach others to grow, to make them actually grow and, and achieve more in their lives. And finally, you get to the third ripple, which is all about the way you build a deep alignment between you, your personal purpose, and the bigger mission of the team, the organization, the community, the football club, whatever you belong to, <laughs> to make a positive impact in the world. So I'd love to know if and how your dad and you have been influenced or not by the positive psychology philosophy and work of the last decades, actually, uh, Stephen. And where do you see alignment and differences as well, you know, nuances in both approaches? Yes. Wonderful question. And, and, and the short answer is absolutely. I think there's an extraordinary alignment between the work my father did and this positive leadership and the work that I'm doing on trust yes. and this positive leadership. And, and because the basic approach that my father had and that I also have kind of adopted building on, you know, standing on the shoulders of my father is this inside out model, which is the gist of the, the, the descriptors you've described of these three circles, these three rings of yes. me and then me and others, and then me and the world. And and um, and so that's inside out. And so, you know, we might use different language or nomenclature to describe it, but the principle is the same. And the principle is inside out. It always starts with ourself. And you're right, the first, you know, in the seven habits, the first three habits are what my, call, my father called the private victory. Yeah. The, the victory for with self and self, you know right. that becoming moving from dependence to in, independence yep. that private victory and the next three habits habits four five and six is the public victory now you are able to work and succeed with others interdependently and that's a higher value you, you know interdependence is a higher value than independence yeah. because it includes independence hmm. but it also goes beyond now to to how we relate with others and how we work with others to achieve greater things together. But interdependence is a choice that only independent people can make. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's, it's always soft. inside out. Exactly. Yes. But then we ripple out into a broader effect of how we then overlap who we are and how we relate to the world with and our purpose with how we can contribute to making purposes in society and to making a difference to matter to move really from sickness from success yep. to significance yes. and overlapping purpose overlapping the individual purpose with organizational purpose or community purpose or societal purpose and i call this co-purposing co and when you overlap that overlapping purpose your individual purpose with organizational or community or societal purpose, that's when you tap into, into great capacity and, and power and contribution and into truly mattering mm -hmm. and making a difference and unleashing the greatest potential that we have inside of us. And, and that's where we want to want, want to get. And so I think there's an extraordinary hmm. alignment hmm. and uh, between the, the positive leadership approach and what we call the principle centered leadership approach. Yes because the we are drawing upon a fundamental principle hmm. that's inside out and 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 um and i think that that applies any everywhere throughout the world and in any leadership position in any role it always starts with ourselves looking in that mirror and owning it and taking responsibility and rippling out from there and my work on trust i've done a similar thing yeah. is i've focused on the five waves of trust which is another version yeah, yeah. of those three <laughs> circles <laughs> Self-trust leads to relationship trust, uh -huh. which leads to team and organizational trust, which leads to market and stakeholder trust, mm. which leads to community and societal trust. Society. Inside yeah. out. So if you want to build trust in the society, start by looking in the mirror with ourselves and ripple out from there. We get enough of these ripple effects going on. We'll impact <laughs> our world. We'll change our world and get those sparks like we were talking you were mentioning earlier, those sparks of inspiration yep. going. <laughs> It's contagious and we can ripple and affect others. And this is not a, a nice to have 
dream. It's real. It's practical. It's tangible. And all it takes is to focus on one relationship. So maybe what I would say to our listeners and our viewers is, is um, um, try this, test this, huh. become a trust and inspire person to another. Because I'll bet if you think about it, that each of us, most of us, if not all, have probably had, had someone in our life yeah. who believed in us, hmm. who had confidence in us. Maybe they, maybe someone else believed in us more than we ever believed in ourselves and, and saw potential and greatness and talent. Maybe they gave us an opportunity and we didn't feel like we were ready. And they said, no, you're ready. You can do this. You got this. And they gave us that chance. And with such a person, whether it be a, a boss or a, a leader or a f- coach or a friend or a mentor or a family member or someone in the community, someone who believed in you, who, insp- who, mm. who saw your potential, who had confidence in you, someone who trusted and inspired you. Mm. Think, think on such a person and what that did to you, mm. how, how it made you feel, how you responded to it, and how you saw yourself differently because of them. And now I ask, as you reflect upon such a person, what if you were to become that kind of leader mentor coach for another and rather than trying to take on everything all at once start with one relationship one at a time again yes one at a time identify one relationship you'd like to transform through you becoming a trust and inspire person figure leader in that person's life just like someone has been in your life and just start there Hmm. you model you trust you inspire it's simple it's just not easy. But this is the kind of leadership that's needed today, Jean-Philippe. And you you are a good illustration of this, what you're doing with this podcast to influence people, to ignite that fire within and get a lot of fires lit and the impact that this can have in the world to counteract what we see going on in our world of distrust everywhere. You're, mm. we're, no, trying to, we're trying to counteract that and say yes, but there's pockets of trust and confidence and inspiration that also can spread. And we're gonna focus on that. We're gonna lead from the inside out. And ultimately, we're gonna try to move from success to significance in our society. So wow. what an honor to be with you. <laughs> well, last couple of questions, Stephen, but before sh- shifting gears, I would say, well, no, I visualize not only the fires of trust, but also visualize the ways and the sea of the changes happening in the world. So I can see you know, a full <laughs> landscape, a full landscape in front of me. I you love it. With your, with your wonderful- uh, That's vision. <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful dialogue, Stephen. You know, one thing I believe has changed since 1989 when, when, the, when your father obviously published this, uh, the book, the famous book, is the desire by most people now, most, not just the, the Gen Z's, to take a job that is meaningful in harmony with their values and purpose. And of course, the young generation in particular cannot imagine working for a company that does not drive a positive impact in society through its action, investment, whether it's carbon negative organization or companies building an inclusive and ethical culture and more. So what is your take on those new demands? And how do you rationalize that, if that's a proper word, I'm not sure, that additional dimension to the framework, which you know might be uh, building a positive change in the world, potentially become a new habit for highly effective people. That's a question, not a suggestion. <laughs> that positive change in the world, is it somewhere already included into the framework you have, or is it developing because of the outside coming to the inside now of the world and people asking for that alignment with what they want to see the change in the world? I think that's beautiful. I, it's a very insightful question. So let me answer that on two fronts. First, in my father's work, so seven habits was kind of yeah. contained where we described and those three domains, you know, the private victory leading to public victory and then the renewal of it so that we can expand out. Um, and then my father, uh, some 15 years later, after writing yeah. seven habits, wrote another work that he called the eighth habit. Yes. <laughs> and it wasn't that he it wasn't that he forgot one. Yeah. So it's not trying to say I forgot a habit. What he did was he added a new dimension to all of this by doing what you just described, Jean-Philippe. He added this sense of purpose Mm. and contribution to everything that we're doing. And he entitled the eighth habit this, find your voice Mm. 
and inspire others to find theirs. And so that find your voice is connect to your purpose, to what matters, and do that first, and then inspire others Others. to connect to their purpose, to find their voice. So he called it voice. By voice, he meant to purpose and meaning and contribution and to your uniqueness and your talents as well. Find your voice and inspire others to find theirs. So he made the evolution that you (laughs) described of saying there is something beyond just being effective. And he called it moving from effectiveness to greatness. greatness, So that that there's a greater purpose in what what it's all about. It's not just that I'm effective. Yeah. I'm now moving to contribution, contribution and to making a difference. And then for me and my work, yes, this is exactly, it's actually mm. written right into my core model, which mm. is those three things. Yeah. As trust-inspired leaders, we model, we trust, and we inspire. inspire. So that third point, we have a stewardship, mm. a responsibility to inspire those who we lead. And again, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily charismatic. We might be, we might not be. But what it does mean is that we model the behavior, we extend trust to people, which inspires, but then we connect with people yeah. through caring at the, in, at the relationship level and through creating a sense of belonging and inclusion at the team level. So we connect with people through caring and belonging. But then it's vital that we connect people to purpose and to meaning, and to contribution, to mattering, to making that difference, to overlapping purpose, and allowing them the opportunity to see how what they're about can overlap with what we're about, what we're trying to do, so that we tap into that, so that we inspire those that we lead, and not just manage them, so, and not just motivate them. Mm. You know, motivation is carrot and stick. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just limited. It can go so far. You know, do, do rewards work? Sure. They motivate people to want to get more rewards. But inspiration goes beyond motivation. It's internal. It's intrinsic. When that fire is lit inside, again, it can burn for years without the need for constant new stimuli. And it can give people that sense of purpose and mission and contribution. And when they find their own, yeah. and, then, and then you you seek to overlap it, to co-purpose with what we're about. That's what people want. Hmm. They want to matter. They want to leave a legacy. They want to make a difference. They want to contribute. A contribution. I love, my father used to always say this, life is about contribution, not accumulation. Hmm. So it's about making that difference and overlapping this. It is about inspiring in doing this. And so to me, it's built right into my core approach. (laughs) <laughs> that a leader has three stewardships to model, to trust, and to inspire. And in the inspire, it's both caring, but it's also purpose, meaning, and contribution. contribution. We've got to overlap that intentionally. And we lead out. We we go first as a leader. What a, what a better way, thank you so much, Stephen, to ask you the very last question. The very last question. She's more personal in a way. So I'd like to ask you the question about your own purpose and your own legacy, Stephen, because I know you've been thinking a lot about that. (laughs) What is it you want to leave behind? What is it you would love your kids, family, friends, clients, and many more who have followed you and your dad to bring to life in their own lives? Tell us. Thank you. (laughs) Um, I hope to be a catalyst along with many others, to help bring about a renaissance of trust and inspiration in our world, to intentionally and deliberately focus on increasing both trust and inspiration in our world. Because as we started off with, as you looked at the Edelman Trust Barometer in your conversation with Richard Edelman, that it's, we're living in a world of declining trust at the macro level, the societal level, that's starting to impact us at the interpersonal level and potentially even at the personal level. And so it's very easy to kind of have that snowball and the ripple effect, the the vicious downward cycle happen. I want to be a catalyst along with others like yourself, Jean-Philippe, and many others to help actually counteract that 
and to bring about a virtuous upward spiral of greater trust, and greater inspiration uh, in our world, to light those fires within and to help those fires light other fires and to have this ripple effect metaphor and concept yeah. be happening everywhere to help bring about a renaissance of trust in our world and and uh, and bring about a better world in the process. So that's my personal mission. It's what drives me. And it's why I keep doing what I'm doing is because I recognize rather than being discouraged by a low trust world, I'm saying yeah. all the more reason in a low trust world why we need leaders and mentors and coaches and examples and models who, know, who are going to lead out and bring it about a high trust world and a better world to live in who know how to trust and inspire and bring about this renaissance of trust that we need. That's my mission, my purpose it's what I'm trying to be about. And I, I'm not pretending myself as a perfect model. Mm. I am saying it's what I aspire to help do and to, and to help bring about this renaissance of trust. So that's who I am and what I'm about. Thank you so much. I mean, it's been such a wonderful, wonderful discussion together. And I really look forward with many others to join this new renaissance movement in 2023 to build trusting, caring, inspiring, and positive leaders that the world needs so more of these days. So thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, uh, St Stephen, uh, I'm sure that our listeners will enjoy that tremendously. Wonder if I'll give you this last thought. Well, it takes two or more people to have trust. It only takes one to start. And each of us can be that one. Can be that one. Let's be that one. Let's be thank that one. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. I really admire you and the tremendous work you are doing to increase trust in our world and inspiration. Thanks Thank so you. much for a wonderful contribution.